Hello, and welcome to our program this evening on Severe Asthma Update, where we're going to look at clinical management and some of the key considerations to optimal patient care. And I'm Dr. Michael Blaze. I'm a clinical professor of pediatrics at the Medical College of Georgia at Augusta University in Augusta, Georgia. And I'm joined this evening by my colleague, Dr. Nick Hanania. Nick. Hi, Mike. Uh, nice to see you uh, through the web. And uh, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm Nick Hanania. I'm one of the pulmonary critical care faculty at Baylor College of Medicine. I uh, direct the Airway Clinical Research Center uh, over there. And it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here to co moderate this with uh, my, my friend Mike Blaze. And our disclosures are shown on the slides. Uh, uh, so you can, uh, you can see what our conflict of interest are. So in our discussion today, we're going to be addressing the following learning objectives. Uh, apply available guidance to diagnose patients with severe versus difficult to treat versus persistent uncontrolled asthma. Identify biomarkers that define types of severe asthma and utilize results to classify patients with severe asthma develop personalized treatment plans for patients with severe asthma that are consistent with our current evidence-based recommendations. We'll identify comorbidities that have an impact on the treatment of severe asthma and discuss treatment strategies. And finally, we'll describe strategies for the prevention and treatment of COVID-19 in patients with severe asthma. Well, very ambitious agenda here, and uh, why are we here today? Well, obviously, the title of this program is Severe Asthma, and it's certainly me as a pulmonologist, my cure an allergist, but if you, you're a primary care doc or, uh, or a pediatrician or an internist, you see lots of patients with severe asthma. And indeed, uh, asthma is an old disease, but we really have not uh, figured out how to control it. In fact, even in the United States, up till now, 2020, uh, about 50% of patients out there, whether it's adults or children, have uncontrolled disease. Uh, now, we can blame the patient for this, but obviously there are several reasons why these patients are uncontrolled. One of which is we missing the target of treatment. And one of the things we try to do today is to discuss, you know, what are things and strategies we do. Uh, obviously, uncontrolled asthma has a big, big impact, a uh, big impact on the patient, big impact on the healthcare system, a big impact on the caregivers, if it's a child or if it's an older patient. Uh, and obviously, exacerbation risk is a major problem with uncontrolled asthma. And this is a, something that we try to avoid, the, you know, the biggest impact on the patient and the healthcare system are exacerbation. And Mike, you were going to add more about the economic impact and the human impact on this. Uh, and uh, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, you know, again, these, these severe or difficult to treat asthma population are exacerbation prone. I mean, these are the really the high cost asthma patients. And when you look at the data and you look at direct costs, so our cost, uh, medication costs, ED visits, hospitalizations, most of the studies show these are the patients that add up to about 80% of those direct costs. And we're not even talking about indirect costs, missing work and the child missing school, uh, early mortality because in Unfortunately, we still see uh, death in these patients associated with asthma, and, and there's economic consideration with that. Um, so it's a real problem. You know, maybe we could start with, because I think this causes some of the confusion out there, uh, what's the difference between uncontrolled and difficult to treat uh, and, and severe asthma in our, in our population? Uh, I'm, I'm glad you asked this question, and let me clarify this because uh, they, I agree with you. There's quite a bit of confusion between uh, the definition of uncontrolled and severe, and is it the same? And of course, it's not. Uh, and uh, I, 
if you go back one slide, I wanted to show you the, the definitions and what we know about them. So uncontrolled asthma, which is about 50% of patients out there, is basically those patients with symptoms who continue to have symptoms, um, you know, and who we, we, can, we can measure symptoms by using questionnaires, by asking the right questions. Of course, the wrong question to ask a patient with asthma is how are you doing? That's not a good question, but we want to know how much you're doing. We use questionnaire to assess asthma control. We also assess, uh, assess it by knowing the risk, uh, risk of exacerbation. Somebody with high risk of exacerbation is also by definition uncontrolled. Now another definition that GINA, the international body for, for asthma therapy and, and who sets some strategies, define difficult to treat asthma is uncontrolled asthma that requires a high, medium to high dose uh, controller therapy namely inhaled corticosteroids, but also other controllers on top, and including oral steroid need. And then severe asthma is the tip of the iceberg. That's about 5 10 per, to 10% of all uncontrolled patients with asthma. Those are patients who require other high-dose steroids, other controllers, but also oral steroids for more than 50% of the year, uh, or they are dependent on oral steroids for the whole uh, treatment of asthma. And those who become uncontrolled if we try to lower the dose, provided that we went through a checklist a checklist to check why they are uncontrolled, because not all uncontrolled patients have necessarily severe disease. And so maybe, Mike, you can shed light on uh, the strategies of approach to know how is, how is it different between uncontrolled and severe, and what, what would the clinician need to do? So, so that was great, and I think that's important. So, so with that, we will we'll shift our attention hat now, and we'll focus on, on that patient evaluation. So how do we, as clinicians, distinguish severe asthma from asthma that's simply uncontrolled or, or difficult to treat? And then once we've established the patient has severe asthma, you know, what are our next steps? So I think it's extremely important as we look at distinguishing severe asthma from, from difficult to treat is one is we need to confirm the diagnosis. And I think all of us have seen patients referred in many cases for severe asthma or difficult to treat asthma. In fact, they don't have asthma. So there could be some other underlying condition like vocal cord dysfunction. So we really want to confirm a spirometry that there truly is airflow obstruction. And if we don't see reversibility, uh, then it may be important to do bronchial provocation, uh, do a challenge test to in fact see if there is truly bronchial hyperreactivity. In other words, we really need to prove that the patient has asthma. And then probably the, the two most common things that I see um, that lead to, to difficult to treat asthma is dealing with correct inhaler technique and adherence. And we have so many different types of inhalers now, we have powder, breath actuated, meter dose inhalers, um, uh, and they're all done to a certain degree differently. And again, if the patient's not inhaling them correctly, it's not gonna to get to the lungs, it's not gonna improve their condition. So we do need to observe their inhaler technique. We need to make sure that it is correct at each visit. And then the other problem we run into so much is adherence. You know, when people feel well, um, you know, they stop taking their medicine. But as we know, that's not gonna work at asthma. It's a chronic condition with, with acute flare-ups. So we have to find out why, and if they're not adherent, why aren't they not adherent? Do they not understand the right way? Another big issue I run into is cost. So we need to look at all of those types of things. And then what are the potential risk factors and comorbidities? In other words, have we taken care of these problems which may be leading to difficult to treat asthma? So what are some of those risk factors? We all know smoking, uh, vaping now, uh, has become a big issue. Certain medications can worsen asthma. So a patient may be placed on a beta blocker, aspirin, NSAIDs can do it. And then they have some new allergen exposure, maybe a new occupational exposure, or maybe something new in the home, a new pet, um, a mold in the home. So one has to look for these things. And then very importantly here, you know, is to identify uh, the important and manage uh, any types of comorbidities, things like 
uh, chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps or gastroesophageal reflux disease, which all of these things may lead to, to a worsening of, of asthma. So once we worked on that, uh, again, asthma is not one disease. There are many different phenotypes. And this can be very helpful looking at the phenotypes as far as determining uh, what would make sense as far as, uh, as care for the patient. So what type of evaluation do we do for looking for the different asthma phenotypes? So one, is, is the patient uh, eosinophilic? Do they have the eosinophilic asthma phenotype? So we look at blood eosinophils, ENO, sputum eosinophils. Now, I think something very important here to remember is if that patient's on high-dose inhaled corticosteroids or daily or altered or every other day oral corticosteroids, those numbers may be suppressed, yet they may still be eosinophilic. Or do they have an allergic phenotype? Um, so clinical history, did they start as a child? Were they part of the atopic march? They had atopic dermatitis going into allergic rhinitis and asthma? Do they have positive a skin prick test to particular allergens that may be driving their asthma? And what about their serum IG? You could do in vitro tests for allergens. And again, what's their total IgE level? And also, are they steroid dependent? And this may be very important as far as, again, uh, looking at how we will eventually treat the patient. So getting a history of uh, how often they're having steroid bursts, but very importantly, are they on daily or alternate day uh, uh, therapy? All of those are very important. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, thank you very much, Mike, for this really wonderful uh, summary of how to approach this. But you mentioned comorbidities, and I really want to hone on this because, you know, often we see patients with referred to us with severe asthma, and, you know, we forget we sort of focus on the lung. Me, I'm a pulmonologist, so that's where I think that's the most important organ in the body. Uh, maybe you don't disagree, maybe you think it's the nose, but I think the nose is very important too. But we often forget other systems that may affect asthma control. And, and certainly you mentioned uh, some of the tools like measuring biomarkers uh, and certainly blood eosinophils and IgE or, and cell nitric oxide are important. But I think questions about like GI comorbidities, uh, uh, you know, very important, the nose and the sinuses, uh, especially if you have an eosinophilic uh, phenotype for the asthma. Now that we're measuring blood eosinophils quite often, and in some centers they measure sputum eosinophils, not every patient with asthma who have high blood eosinophils just have asthma. They may have have asthma, but there are other eosinophilic comorbidities. And so one has to keep that in mind. And, and you know, I want to briefly give an overview, but before I do that, I wanted to ask your opinion. You know, when you see somebody with blood eosinophil and you measure it, do you measure it one time or you measure it more than once? So what's, what's your thought on this? It's going to vary. Uh, so in general, obviously in, in the workup of that patient, I'm going to, to look at bloody eosinophils. Again, I'm going to need to know what other medicines are on that may have been affecting it, as we mentioned about the steroids. And I think there's some very good data out there now um, that following bloody eosinophils can also tell you how well, in fact, the, the patient is doing. And there's been some good data that suggests that there's good correlation between uh, lowering levels of the lower levels of bloody eosinophils and improvement in the patient's asthma condition. Yeah, I think this eosinophilic phenotype is something that really we have to focus on and, and indeed uh, it's an important one, I, uh, but one has to keep in mind that, you know, blood eosinophilia can also be affected by the treatments the patient is on, especially if they're on oral steroids. So, uh, so having a low eosinophil, uh, if a patient is on oral steroid, does not rule it out. But what are other eosinophilic uh, comorbidities that cannot can coexist with asthma. And obviously they are rare, but somebody has, you know, with, with, with this uh, patients with coming in with severe asthma with eosinophilia, one, one of these comorbidities can be the EGPA or previously called Shirk-Strauss syndrome. Uh, these patients, uh, 
can present with asthma, they have significant eosinophilia in the periphery, but they often have multiple other uh, organs involved, including the neuropathy, uh, they may have uh, pulmonary infiltrates on the x-ray, uh, often they have upper airway problem and sinuses, and uh, skin rashes are not uncommon, and then often they may have a, a positive ANCA, you can do a serology. So you have to think about it if you have somebody with other systemic involvement with high blood eosinophil. And indeed, if you see the next slide, the, there are several stages for eGPA. There's a prodromal allergic phase, uh, where patients present mainly with asthma, possibly with allergic rhinitis and upper airway. There is an eosinophilic phase, which usually is a more severe, where they have peripheral eosinophilia and eosinophilic tissue infiltration. And then uh, finally, uh, the more severe form is a systemic uh, vasculitic phase, where these patients may have peripheral neuropathy, palpable purpura, uh, and other necrotizing glomerular nephritis and other renal involvement. So that's one. There are other, even more rarer diseases, but these are eosinophilic comorbidities that can coexist with asthma. And the, uh, the one is hyper eosinophilic syndrome, uh, or HES. Now, it's a rare blood disorder. Uh, often, their blood eosinophil levels are more than 1,500 uh, cells per cubic liter, uh, persistent for more than six months. Uh, and it's usually progressive and chronic in nature. And occasionally, you may get uh, these patients uh, referred to from uh, hematology colleagues. And often, they have other organ involvement in, with inflammation. Uh, you know, there are several subtypes, as you see on this slide, a myeloproliferative, uh, a lymphoproliferative, and a, there's an undefined subtype. Uh, these are very uh, hard to treat patients, often are oral steroid dependent, and, but now with, with the, the presence of some biologics, they may be uh, uh, better treated. Uh, there is another one that I would like to mention, and that's something that, uh, um, and, and so this is, a, this is when you have to consider HES. Somebody referred to you with very high blood eosinophil, um, at least measured on two occasions, uh, with pathologic confirmation of tissue hyper eosinophilia, uh, often they have other systematic involvement, like you see um, skin rashes, neurologic symptoms, fatigue and fever. Uh, and then obviously you have to do some uh, uh, testing and refer to hematologists who can actually confirm the diagnosis. Another important eosinophilic comorbidity, uh, which may be associated with polyposis and maybe not, is chronic rhinosinusitis. And that's something that our allergy colleagues often see, and uh, it, it, it is very commonly associated with asthma. It can precede asthma or can come after the diagnosis of asthma. Uh, and, and some of these patients have high blood eosinophilia, others do not. Um, and, and not all of these patients have allergic uh, phenomena. Um, in fact, they have severe eosinophilia, but may, may not have allergic uh, mechanisms. Uh, it's, an example is a, is a aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease, or what we used to call aspirin sensitive asthma. So often these patients have asthma. There's an important health impact of a chronic rhinosinusitis. You know, I don't know how many of you have blocked nose, and quality of life is certainly disturbed. Um, uh, not only the, the at night, but also during the day, uh, there's increased risk of, of exacerbation of asthma in the presence of chronic rhinosinusitis. Uh, it is tends to be more likely in in, women, in males than females, uh, uh, and and then again. Uh, uh, nasal polyps can be part of it, and obviously nasal polyps have to be as uh, diagnosed by rhinoscopy um, and often need surgical therapy, but also now in the presence of biologics, uh, these can be treated uh, with biologics if they're recurrent. So on the next slide, you see some uh, pictures of uh, a nasal polyp. Uh, not sure how many of you, if you're not an allergist, look in the patient's nose. I try to do it. Uh, I usually like to refer to my colleagues, uh, the other the ENT docs and allergists, but it is something that you have to think of, especially patients with asthma who have persistent nasal obstruction despite nasal steroids, antihistaminic, and obviously, of occasionally we have to do uh, sinus CT scans to diagnose this, and there is a different different stages, and uh, unfortunately, many of these patients have. Um, loss of smell, loss of uh, of smell is very common symptom, 
and um, uh, of course nasal congestion, problem with uh, recurrent sinusitis, needing antibiotics, facial pressure, uh, and, uh, and often uh, complicate the course of their asthma as well. And when you treat the nose, we know that asthma can get better. Um, so, uh, so these are some uh, comorbidities that are characterized by eosinophilia that can uh, not only mimic, but can coexist with asthma that you have to think of. Uh, and I'm glad that Dr. Blaise, Mike, you brought up phenotyping because this is a very important way of personalizing the approach uh, to asthma, because for many years we thought asthma is just a one-phase disease, and now we know that it is not, and there are multiple phenotypes, but there are also multiple uh, comorbidities. So back to you, Mike. Thanks. So, 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 so with that, think, Nick, uh, that uh, gives us uh, really a great background now uh, as we thoroughly assess the patient and we've established uh, their phenotype. So I guess the, the next subject we want to cover now is, you know, how do we approach treatment in these patients? You know, what factors should we use to, to guide our treatment decisions in, in these asthma patients? So here we're looking first at a, a brief overview of, of asthma treatment. So we have the reliever um, medications, which unfortunately they're still in many cases overused, especially short acting beta agonists. Uh, you also see on here low dose inhaled cortical steroid for Motorol. Now, uh, this comes from the GINA guidelines. Um, and again, in the United States, this as yet has not been approved uh, for uh, reliever treatment, though I, I think that we may see that in the near future approved by the FDA. And then we have the short acting anticholinergics. The controller medications. And again, the gold standard has been inhaled cortical steroids with or without long-acting beta agonists. We have the leukotriene modifiers and chromones uh, that are used to, to a lesser degree. Uh, in the more severe patient, uh, we have the add-on controller medications where the inhaled cortical steroid long-acting beta agonists are not giving us optimal control. Things like long-acting anticholinergics, targeted biologics, and when we have to, systemic cortical steroids. And some ad additional treatments that are used in, in, again, some of the more severe patients, especially the non-type two, as we'll talk about, macrolides, which have an anti-inflammatory effect, and, and then the role of bronchial thermoplasty in some of these patients. So, so with that, these are the uh, targeted uh, biologic therapies for severe asthma. Um, we'll look at the ones approved. We'll look at one that's in phase three. So probably uh, many of you are familiar with omalizumab directed against IgE. Uh, it's hard for me to believe that it's been around now for, for 17 years. Uh, we know that its indication by the FDA is a positive perennial skin test or in vitro reactivity to a perennial allergen. Very important is the patient's total serum IgE level and body weight as far as dosing. It's approved down to the age of six. Presently, it does not have FDA approval for uh, home administration, though there has been a letter right now of possible use from the FDA related to COVID. Uh, we may see uh, approval by the FDA in 2021 for home administration. Mebolizumab, directed against IL-5, is indicated for add-on maintenance and eosinophilic phenotype. It's approved down to six and is available for home administration. Resolizumab is by IV only. It's the only one that's also given by body weight. Uh, it's also directed against IL-5 and has the same indication as mebolizumab, add-on maintenance and eosinophilic phenotype and it's approved 18 and older. Benzerilumab is directed against the IL-5 or alpha receptor, so blocking the action of IL-5. Again, it is also approved by the FDA for add-on maintenance and eosinophilic phenotype down to the age of 12 and can be home administered. And dupilumab, which blocks the IL-4 or alpha receptor, therefore blocking the effects of IL-4 and IL-13, has three indications, add-on maintenance for moderate to severe asthma, also eosinophilic phenotype, and corticosteroid-dependent any phenotype. 
It's indicated now down to the age of 12 and can be administered at home. And in phase three being developed is tezapilumab, which is directed against uh, thymic stromolymphopoietin, which is one of the epithelial alarmins that can also uh, act, uh, lead to a type two inflammatory disease. We'll have to wait for further studies and, and FDA approval. So if we're looking at type two severe asthma, um, we have to one, see if that's what the patient has. And then with that, uh, what is the consideration for add-on biologic therapy? So, so the first thing we're gonna wanna do in these patients with severe disease, again, is uh, making sure that they truly are adherent. So it's not just difficult to treat. Uh, have we increased their inhaled cortical steroid dose for the last three to six months and seeing how that is done? Do they have evidence of, of underlying type two disease? So do they have aspirin or NSAID exacerbated respiratory disease or allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, or as you uh, just heard about, chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps or atopic dermatitis? So is add-on type two biologic therapy then available? Does it fit for that patient? Is it affordable? Well, if the answer is no, then what do we consider for that patient? One would be higher doses of inhaled steroid if not used. This may be a time for non-biologic add-on therapies. Uh, if they haven't already been on LAVAs, in most cases they have been, but maybe teotropium, uh, leukotriene receptor antagonist or macrolide. Um, we may have to go to low dose oral cortical steroid or alternate day dosing to minimize side effects. And very importantly here, and I think something sometimes we don't think about, is, is stopping ineffective add-on therapies. If the patient's not getting better, then you know why should we keep them on more and more polypharmacy? But what if in fact, uh, uh, there is according in the workup, the patient does fit a phenotype where a type two biologic's available and it's affordable. So what do we do in as far as consideration here? So these again would be patients that are having exacerbation or poor symptom control or high dose inhaled cortical steroid long acting beta agonist and high eosinophilia or other allergy biomarkers that suggest type two disease or they need maintenance oral cortical steroids. All of these would be reasons to consider biologic therapy. We also have to look at the local payer eligibility and criteria. Almost always these agents are gonna require prior authorization. Uh, predictors of response, and we'll hear from Dr. Hanania in just a, a minute about some of those, because that's extremely important to make sure that we feel the patient would respond. And obviously there's the issues of cost again, dosing frequency, route, and, and patient preference. And I think a lot of this in many cases, uh, we would need to do shared decision-making with the patient to in fact determine uh, if, that, if that is uh, appropriate. Uh, so with that, Nick, how do we go about uh, selecting an add-on biologic, a, a type two targeted uh, therapy? Uh, thanks, Mike, for this uh, nice uh, setting up the stage to discuss this. And I'm glad you brought up uh, the shared decision making because after all this is a two-way highway um, it, it doesn't work with just as us as clinicians without looking at patients uh, of course payers make a big difference because some patients may not have coverage so you brought that up but if the options are there you need to discuss with your patient uh, you need to give him or her the options especially that most of these biologics are available there may be some quite a bit of overlap where in more than one instance, more than one biologic may work. And so the question is which one to choose. Now, I will go through what uh, the GINA uh, strategy suggests based on clinical trials. In real life, there, are, there may be some other differences. Uh, there is a shared decision-making tool that I'm glad that uh, I've worked on with CHEST and with American College of Allergy Immunology. And it's actually a web-based tool that one can access. Uh, you can find it on the website and patients can take the website and can read about the biologics you're suggesting for him and her and can come back and discuss it. Another thing importantly before you prescribe is that patients need to know that this is not a one-shot 
thing. It's not a one-time deal. It's a long-term process. It's not a cheap process. It will uh, require compliance with this. It's not just once a month and then forget about it and come back in three months. So all these things are important. But taking all these in consideration, when do I cho choose an anti-IgE? When do I choose an anti-IL-5? When do I choose an anti-IL-4? And now more and more are coming. Uh, and, and, and these are almost all targeting type 2 asthma, as Dr. Blaze mentioned. Type 2 asthma is characterized by other high blood eosinophil or, or sputum eosinophil, high phenolevel, allergic component, um, and uh, also uh, a, a patient on oral steroid dependent. All these fit the type 2 asthma based on GINA suggestion. There are the non-type 2 asthma, which we will or, or type 2 low asthma, which uh, Dr. Blaze will discuss. Coming back to uh, anti-IgE, uh, who are the persons who would be most eligible for this type of treatment? Obviously, anti-IgE is approved for allergic asthma. The patient has to demonstrate positivity to either skin test or blood test with allergen-specific IgE to common uh, um, perennial allergens, not necessarily it shouldn't be just seasonal allergy. You have to show the high blood IgE. It is the dose is calculated based on weight and serum IgE level. And they have to have history of exacerbation despite adequate therapy with uh, inhaled corticosteroid plus another controller. Uh, in one of the studies we published, we showed that higher blood eosinophil, high pheno, um, high T2 biomarker may actually enrich the patient population who may have better response to omelizumab, although in real-life studies, blood eosinophil per se may not be the best predictor, and even allergic phenomena is certainly a very important one. What about anti-IL-5? As you see in the following slide, uh, when you, anti-IL-5s target, as the name implies, IL-5. IL-5 cytokine is a very important cytokine for uh, basically pampering eosinophils, bringing them to the airway, uh, preventing them from dying, maturation of eosinophils. So somebody with eosinophilic asthma, blood eosinophils more than 300, although in some studies more than 150 consistently, at least on three occasions with history of exacerbation, uh, may actually benefit from an anti-IL-5 injection. Obviously, the in clinical trials, patients, the higher the blood is in the field, the better response, the higher the severity, the more exacerbation, the better response. And in some clinical trials, adult onset asthma and those with nasal polyps tend to have a better response to an anti-IL-5. What about an anti-IL-4 uh, receptor? And the Pilumab is the only one we have now. Uh, it certainly has been studied in a large uh, uncontrolled asthma population. Uh, in, that, in those large clinical trials, those patients with high blood eosinophils and high T2 asthma, basically high pheno, uh, were shown to have the best uh, effect. Whether they are allergic or not didn't matter. Uh, we've published papers to show that allergic asthma patients who have eosinophilic or T2 asthma will benefit from an anti-IL-4 receptor. In clinical trials, um, studies have suggested that those who probably have the best effect are those with high blood eosinophil, high pheno, or even both being high. But also some comorbidities for which this drug has been approved, uh, such as atopic dermatitis, uh, chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps, and oral steroid dependency, uh, whether they have high blood eosinophils or not. So this gives you a somewhat of a guidance, knowing for a fact that there's quite a bit of overlap between uh, uh, one biologic group versus the other. The, also another important question that I always get faced with in the clinic is that, okay, so how long? Patients ask me, doc, okay, I go on this. Am I gonna be on it forever? How do I know if I'm gonna benefit or not? Very important questions. Uh, and sometimes we can't answer right away. But one thing we know is that we need to give these drugs time for, for to work. So some suggestion, again, this is not based on solid evidence, but this is a suggestion from Gina, that at least when you start a biologic, no matter which one, at least four months of therapy, unless the patient gets side effects, obviously, in general, most of these drugs are fairly safe. Of course, they don't work the same in every person, so we have to monitor these patients, especially first injection in some of these 
um, uh, biologics, but at least four months of treatment and then assess response. Um, you can assess response by looking at asthma control and some of these drugs can improve lung function. Uh, so asthma, lung function usually improves, uh, especially with anti-IL-4 receptor, you will see a big jump in lung function early, early on. But more important is how the patient feels. And if the patient uh, has some effect, but is still unclear, you can extend the trial to from six to 12 months. So, uh, but obviously, on the other hand, if the patient has, uh, has a very good response, uh, then uh, the next slide you'll see that, uh, that you, uh, you continue on this drug and reevaluate every three to six months. Uh, if the patient is on oral steroid, try to cut down on the oral steroid very carefully and slowly, especially if they've been on it for a long time. And even the dose of inhaled steroids may be cut down. But this is important. These drugs do not replace the inhaled steroids. So these patients still will need a controller therapy on top of uh, the, the injections. This is important because patients think that, okay, I'm going to take one injection a month, then I'm going to stop all of my asthma medication. So that's where asthma education is very important. Um, uh, but certainly uh, we monitor them also for any side effects. Unfortunately, you'll have to fill up lots of forms to keep them on the drug to show that it's working. And insurance uh, it always plays a major role in determination because these are not cheap drugs. However, in some situation, uh, patients do not show any response. And, and actually the patient will tell you, doc, this is not working for me. I'm not gonna come every month to get the injection. I'm not gonna inject myself every two weeks at home. So that's when you have to reassess. Patient has T2 asthma, they're compliant with inhalers, but the drug is not working. That's when you may consider after to four months switching to a different targeted therapy. Maybe you can reassess their uh, biomarker profile. Uh, if there is no effect, then you may have to look at other uh, interventions. Uh, some, some have been mentioned, uh, reassess the phenotype, uh, maybe consider um, uh, uh, bronchothermoplasty, uh, look at other uh, interventions, macrolide and others. So this is in a nutshell how we approach these patients with T2 high asthma. But as we mentioned, asthma is not a one-phase disease. It's not all about T2. Of course, 60% of severe asthma have T2 asthma, T2 type asthma, but there are about 40% who have non-type 2 asthma. And so, Mike, what would you do with those patients? And I know we don't know too much about them, but are there any strategies to approach non-type 2 asthma patients? And I think this is important. Uh, again, it does make up uh, a significant percent of have severe asthma. So uh, as you mentioned, they're not going to uh, um, be eligible, at least for the biologic therapies that are presently approved by the FDA uh, for the management of severe asthma. So first, I think, you know, again, we need to make sure in these patients that what we're dealing with is asthma. So, you know, the differential diagnosis here, make sure it's not some other underlying condition. Again, things I mentioned previously, but extremely important. Uh, is their inhaler technique correct? Are they truly adherent to the particular treatments? Are we dealing with, with any comorbidities? Um, gastroesophageal reflux disease. Um, uh, 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 I mentioned about chronic rhinosinusitis. So other types of comorbidities that may be worsening their condition. Again, are they having any particular side effects uh, from treatments that they're already on that may be leading to problems too? Very importantly, are there any exposures out there that may be worsening their condition that we can help work with the patient to try to eliminate? Obviously, there's still a percentage of the population uh, that smoke cigarettes. Obviously, we have to deal with, uh, with vaping in the population now, uh, which I think data clearly now suggests that it worsens asthma. Uh, there could be allergens that are worsening their condition or they're around irritants, either at home or occupation. And we may want to consider further investigations looking for other underlying uh, pulmonary conditions. So sputum induction, we might want a high resolution CT scan of the chest, again, uh, looking for, for other types of conditions. Um, and bronchoscopy, 
uh, may also be indicated in these patients. So, so what are some of the other treatments that we may want to consider as far as add-on in our non-type 2 severe asthma patient population? Uh, teotropium uh, definitely makes sense. Uh, a macrolide, if these haven't been tried, because at least there is some data that suggests they may be beneficial, always worth a try. We may have to go to low-dose uh, oral cortical steroids again, ideally trying to use uh, the lowest dose daily possible. Maybe we, maybe we can control them with alternate day dosing, which again would have even less side effects. And as I mentioned previously, very important, you know, if the patient's on numerous medications that may not be having an effect, then maybe they need to be stopped. Again, we don't need uh, the polypharmacy here in, in these particular patients. We want to use what's working. And I do think there's an option in these patients for bronchial thermoplasty, uh, especially when these other medical treatments have failed uh, and we're clear that this is a true non-type 2 uh, severe uh, asthma patient. Now, uh, it's important to look at, uh, uh, Nick, and you talked about some of these comorbid eosinophilic diseases. And as we know, uh, again, they are uh, usually, again, type 2 mediated condition. Um, and so it's interesting to see the, the studies that are ongoing uh, for these conditions and others uh, with the biologics that have been approved for, for type 2 uh, asthma. So for mebolizumab, uh, in fact, they finished their phase 3 study. Uh, so we may see approval in the, in the future for chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps. It is already approved for EGPA and is in phase three for hypereosinophilic syndrome. Rezolizumab is in phase two for EGPA and benzorilumab is in phase three for all three of these comorbid eosinophilic conditions and we may see approval there. And dupilumab uh, is already approved for chronic rhinosinusitis with, with nasal polyps and we've been using it in patients with, with asthma and that condition. And it's in phase two uh, for, for hyper uh, eosinophilic uh, syndrome. Mm -hmm. So, you know, given the current state of affairs that we're dealing with, uh, with the pandemic, uh, I think we'd be remiss, you know, if we didn't dev uh, devote some time here, uh, at least addressing uh, the current uh, pandemic that we are, you know, dealing with uh, on a daily basis and, it appears that we're going to be continuing to deal with uh, for, for the foreseeable months in our patient population. And obviously, there's been a big concern uh, related to COVID-19 and the severe asthma uh, population. So here are some uh, recommendations from the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology as far as management of asthma during COVID-19. Uh, Nick, Kind of give me your feelings and what you've seen in the literature so far associated with uh, with severe asthma and COVID-19. Uh, yeah, Mike, thank you for bringing this up because that's important. You know, obviously COVID-19 affected every one of us, whether it was a patient or not, or a physician or a clinician. Uh, definitely our asthma patients ask questions and we ask the same questions. How safe is it uh, the treatments that we give to these patients, especially inhaled corticosteroids. Initially, we know inhaled corticosteroids have been historically increasing risk of viral pneumonia. Uh, oral steroids, some of these patients are needing it. Initially, we were very, very concerned about giving oral steroids for these patients. Of course, in the hospital setting, nebulization was something that uh, was not allowed because of the aerosolization. Uh, so, that, so it did affect, of course, spirometry. The use of spirometry is something that now is restricted to the only the more severe patients and new admission, new patients that we see in clinic. So, uh, having to see the patient, listen to their lung. So, it did affect the way we approach these patients. The good news, however, uh, there are no data right, right now. There are several Several cohort studies published on asthma patients do not suggest that asthma patients are at higher risk of, uh, in, for COVID infection. Uh, and it may be, especially those with T2 asthma, and in fact, there may be some hypothetical relationship or mechanism where T2 inflammation may actually be protective, although this needs to be further studied. Uh, so that's good. 
Second is inhaled corticosteroids have not been shown to be increasing the risk of patients for COVID infection if they have asthma. And cert certainly oral steroids are now being used for treatment of COVID pneumonia, especially hypoxemic patients. So that's reassuring for our patients. Obviously, biologics were also uh, questioned. Should we continue biologics? Should we stop? Do they increase risk of uh, our patients to COVID-19? Currently, most, uh, most organizations, including the Quad AI, but also other, the WAO and others, uh, do not suggest changing the regimen for biologic therapy in these patients because we don't believe they increase risk for COVID infection. Uh, of course, the home administration is preferred because patients don't want to come to clinic to get these injections. They don't want to be exposed. But certainly, regarding asthma, now that's not the case with other underlying lung diseases such as COPD or smokers. Maybe at, they are at higher risk of of COVID infection and have been shown in at least epidemiologic studies. But regarding asthma, right now we don't see any reason to change the strategy of treatment. Uh, certainly, we're hoping we can get these patients back so that we can examine their chest, do spirometry. That's something that is depends on your area, and spirometry can be uh, utilized in some low-risk areas, but certainly in high uh, prevalence areas like Houston, we are not, not doing spirometry unless we test the patients for COVID-19 before, and hopefully these things will change. Yeah. I, I really think the key here, the take-home message, and something I've also tried to, to really emphasize with, with patients is that it's extremely important that they stay on their treatments, that right now there's absolutely no data that it worsens uh, the possibility of if they get COVID, so that we want them to stay on, on their inhaled cortical steroids and other controller medicines. And again, the same goes for the patients that have severe disease that are on biologics. And there's absolutely no data, as you mentioned, uh, that it could lead to a worsened outcome if the patient gets COVID-19. In fact, we want to keep these patients as well as possible, prevent exacerbations and keep them out of any emergency department uh, at, at this time. So I think that's, it, it's a, that's extremely important in our patient population. So this brings us to a close of our discussion. And again, we've covered a, a lot of interesting uh, subjects related to severe asthma tonight. I'd like to just uh, give you a, a summary session, a summary a, session, uh, uh, a summary of what we've discussed, so that many patients with asthma continue to report severe uncontrolled disease despite treatment. Uh, to improve outcomes in patients with severe uncontrolled asthma, uh, therapy should be highly personalized based on individual characteristics, including the asthma phenotype, as we've discussed, comorbidities, and patient preference, shared decision making. A broad range of non-pharmacologic and pharmacologic interventions are available to help achieve improved asthma control, including a number of type 2 biologic uh, therapies. And as we continue to navigate the current pandemic, patients with severe asthma should continue to adhere to their usual therapy, including the use of controller medications, uh, cortical steroids, and if they're on, uh, biologic. So, uh, Dr. Hanania. Um, before we end tonight, do you have any final thoughts uh, for our uh, audience that you'd like to share? Well, uh, first of all, thank you, Mike, for uh, for uh, having me on. And I, I think one one message is that we do have a new look at this old disease. Uh, it is not a one-face disease, and certainly uncontrolled asthma continues to haunt us, whether you're in primary care or specialty care. But I think if we do it right, if we do our homework right, we can actually get to the bottom of this. Notably, there are patients with severe disease. These are patients who deserve to be seen by asthma specialists like myself or my allergists and pulmonologists. Not because we know better, but that's, that's exactly what we do. And we can tune them up and send them back to primary care. Now that we have some biomarkers, we can actually phenotype the patients. We know what type of face the patient has, what type of asthma. And now we have two large groups of asthmatics. So maybe in the future we'll have more. And I think it's the presence of biologics uh, has helped us to have more targeted approach for this disease. And actually, this is the way to go in medicine, a personalized, uh, more precise approach for treatment. And I think we're not there yet, but we're, we're getting there. Absolutely. 
So, so thank you, Nick. It's been uh, great to, to present with you this evening. And to our audience, I want to thank you uh, for joining us tonight and, and hope this has been very beneficial. So with that, I want to make sure that you do claim your CME credits by completing the post-test in the evaluation form at integrityce.com slash asthmapost. And I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thanks for joining us.